Yeah. But it is today. Is it? Is it Wednesday? Okay. I thought it was Sunday because uh, I felt like I just went to church. <laughs> thank you, uh, Simon. Thank you, Craig. Thank you to the event organizers uh, as well, Adrian Jackson and the uh, Recycling Association for allowing us to be here today. I think it's one of the first times that quality has received um, the due bill that it that it deserves uh, at a conference of this nature. So my, my commendation uh, to all those that helped make this possible. Um, the topic that I've been asked to speak on, how can we compete in a global market? Um, when I started in the business in 1992 um, for PRI, Paper Recycling International, it was a joint venture of Waste Management and Stone Container Corporation. On one side, the largest collector of uh, raw materials, um, largest of which uh, were recyclables, uh, and then on the other side, one of the largest consumers of corrugated in the U.S. and packaging producers. Uh, over those years, we've seen many, many consolidations. And in the course of my history in the, in the industry, I've seen um, how dynamic our business is and what challenges that we have faced. And I would have to say that the last six months to eight months have been the most challenging that I've ever known. So I wanted to, to look at three things. First of all, the competitive landscape. Um, what kind of background in which we are operating. Uh, hopefully some economics, you have to forgive me, I studied economics and finance at university and I still uh, think of it as my first love. Um, you, you will find no better industry uh, to learn about the laws of supply and demand and consumer behavior, um, both at the macro and the micro level. Secondly, I will look at factors that require change and then uh, finally uh, look at the key takeaways, hopefully that we can get for the future and then uh, at the end of my presentation, I hope we can receive some good questions and have uh, a lively debate or discussion. First off, um, since 2015, uh, there are more exports of recovered paper uh, than there are used domestically. I think uh, Simon handled that very well. Um, and I think of that, you know, the amount that's going to China each year um, has grown. In a lot of ways, I think of the, the growth in the industry and China's demand as having underwritten a lot of the curbside recycling programs around the world. And so we owe a lot to that market. Um, but let's look at the economy that stands behind it. I think a lot of us will, will recognize, I don't think the pointer's coming up, um, but if you would recognize this steady growth that we've had for many years in China, upwards of double-digit growth, 14%. Um, I can remember when we first started in 2000 in Europe, uh, it was breakneck pace. Nothing about it was normal. Nothing about it was something that you had seen before. And so companies like myself brought the direct export model here uh, to Europe and the UK and uh, displaced a lot of uh, good traders and, and brokers. So the market began to consolidate. And then in, in 2007, 2008, during the financial crisis, during the Great Recession, the market reset itself, but you will notice a very uh, close V-shape recovery. So even given the, the trials and travails that we undergo now, um, you know, it's, it, it shows me that, that markets are indeed very resilient and can bounce back. But one of the key elements here, as far as the China's, Chinese GDP growth is, is that the economy is growing slower, um, but by design. That's with the idea that the government wants to institute better environmental policy, better energy policy, um, to, to be able to manage the economy for a more sustainable future. Double-digit growth at the end of the day is not always sustainable, nor healthy. Per capita uh, GDP, China versus the UK. I think it's very interesting to note that uh, China, if you can't read the, the, the bar on the right, you've got the blue line, you see this growth um, in GDP. The strength of the Chinese consumer has been growing throughout um, the last 15 years, a very steady line. But then you will also notice the, the UK uh, GDP per capita took a big dip during the recession. What I remember is that the Chinese government put a lot of investment to, to keep the industry stable at that time. When we had the Great Recession, there was a fear that if China were to have gone bust or not to have a stable economic policy, that indeed we would have a much, much deeper crisis on our hands. Um, you know, when I look at that line, it reminds me of the, the Chinese consumers nowadays that I see at Schiphol Airport when I flew out this morning. One of the longest lines that I see is the line at the VAT uh, rebate uh, line. And there's a sign written in Chinese so that they can all fill out their forms. And the first thing that I see are these massive suitcases bulging at the edges with 
uh, with goods and services, uh, or goods that they, they bought here in, in Europe and the UK. Um, just to give you another idea, that uh, GDP per capita is about 6,500 US dollars per person. That's about 51, 52% of the, the global average. And then the UK consumer is, is upwards of 42,000. And that's 320% of, of the global average. So there's a lot of headroom there for the Chinese consumer to still grow and, and develop. And there's a lot of opportunity in that growth as well. Export growth since 2002, again, you can see the demarcation uh, between the um, 2002 and 2007, 2008. But then you notice some, some differences in the way that um, export growth is going in China. In, in, in the first half of the last decade, what we saw is that China was growing a lot on the back of export products. So there was this huge uh, circular economy wherein China was the manufacturer to the world, and then all the goods that we used to see or still see on the shelves, whether you're at uh, Media Mart or at, uh, what is it, Comet, uh, appliance store or at one of the popular chains, ASDA, I hear all that stamps made in China and that drove the growth of, of the packaging industry. And then that all changed during the, the, the economic crisis. Suddenly instead of, of exporting about 60 or 70 percent of the finished product, that market flipped to being more of a domestically driven market. And you see another, another a factor there is that the volatility of that market increases. So it's a, it's a very, very different environment in, in which to operate. So whether you're a producer or a consumer, you're, you're dealing with a, a lot more volatility and a lot more uncertainty um, in, in the marketplace. Here in the UK, um, kind of an interesting uh, look at, at how things are, are going here. We see a very, very steady rise uh, in, in uh, export growth. And then we see at the tail end of uh, 2016, we see a, a very sharp increase. Why is that? Export. Export, if I heard it right. Brexit. Oh, Brexit. Okay. Well, the, the effect on the currency is, is massive. One of the things that we see is that the, the blue line uh, representing the Chinese yuan, which was fixed or pegged to the dollar uh, for some time, then allowed to float. We actually see a change where the renminbi devaluated over the last 15 years and then began to recover since 2014. Um, at the same time that after Brexit, well said, the, the currency for the, for the UK, the British uh, sterling pound, uh, topped out at around um, two, a little over two in 2008, now at 125. What does that do? That makes exports all of a sudden very, very attractive. So um, a few weeks ago when we were at the uh, Recycling Association subcommittee meeting on quality, I had taken a ride from a London cabbie. I, I can't do his accent, but it's wonderful. Um, at any rate, he, he was telling me about these houses in Mayfair. And he said, light bulb houses in Mayfair. I said, light bulb house, what is that? He said, well, it's all these Chinese that are coming over with their money, and they're buying these houses in Mayfair, and uh, really, there's, there's nothing in there but a light bulb on a timer. And the light bulb goes on and off. And that's it. That's the only resident is the light bulb in that house. Money is chasing a place to find home, a, a, a home. And in the meantime, I see those Chinese consumers coming over here and buying everything that they can get their hands on. That's an opportunity. It's also competition. From a Chinese perspective, the, the current growth is based more on domestic consumption <coughs> nowadays than export-driven growth. And in some ways, I call it the twin engine, right? I, I had seen during the, the, the tiger economies back in 95, 96, when we, were, when we were exporting from the United States, quite a lot of tonnage to Indonesia, South Korea, uh, the Philippines, Taiwan. Um, those are the markets that, that were driving growth, but the problem is, is that they were predominantly export driven. They didn't have a domestically driven economy. They didn't have the balance in their economy. And so China has restructured its economy to be able to have both domestic consumption and export production. Um, that makes uh, China a very attractive market, but by like token, it also increases the availability of local collections. So as, the, as the, the Chinese consumer is growing and developing, they're getting a taste for goods from around the world that are now being imported to them. And so that, that collection system is beginning to grow. So you see um, recovery rates that maybe 10 or 15 years ago were estimated, estimated between 25 and 35 percent are now upwards of 65, 70 percent. And on corrugated, I dare say anything goes to the landfill on that. 
Um, <clears throat> the slower GDP growth um, does come with some targeted trade-offs. As I said earlier, um, you can really see that China has a, a, a very structured and determined policy towards environmental regulation. And as, as Simon mentioned, protecting the health of its citizenry. You go back over centuries in China and you look at what is the most important thing for that government, uh, for that society, is social stability. At all costs, social stability. From a UK perspective, the devaluation of the pound against the dollar is a game changer in trade. Um, All-time high of exports, all time. More goods are competing for space on vessels, whether at land, sea, or air. I, I don't know if these markers work, but one thing I want to show you real quick This is UK. This is the US. Right now in the freight market, if we look at the CNF price of what's being shipped to China, I would say one quarter is ocean freight for the US and three quarters is paper value. Right now with the, the increases that we've seen in the last six months alone since October, an increase of about $50 a ton, a metric ton. Three quarters of our CNF value right now is in ocean freight. There is very little headroom right now for us to give up the paper value. So why are prices so difficult at this current moment? We've got ourselves caught in a situation of a different trade of balance. And we need every competitive edge that we can manage or muster. And we're competing with other markets around the world, predominantly the US. So what are the factors requiring change? I'm going to look at three points. Supply and demand, uh, balance of trade, changing regulatory environments, and then strict interpretation of GB standards. First of all, trade of balance. Balance of trade, I should say. Um, the markets peaked at about 30 million ton import of recovered fiber. This is, these are the <coughs> import statistics by grade for China from the uh, China Customs uh, Bureau. You see in 2016, uh, 28 and a half million tons. You see the year before, uh, roughly 28, or excuse me, 29.2 uh, million tons. That is uh, a decrease, but how much? Here, here comes the warning sign. 950,000 tons of mixed and news lost in the last year. Where are these goods sourced? Household material. Let's look at the mixed. On the, on the mixed paper side, I think we're all going to have to squint very well, close. What I see is that the, the UK is the biggest loser in the last year, about 5.61% loss of market share. And in the meantime, you have the other markets. The US is at about 2 million, <clears throat> Japan at about 1.3 million, and the UK at about 1.2 million. Now, let me share something with you. We talk about 1.5% a lot. And we would think, wow, that's, that's a really good standard. If you took the peak of 30 million ton of import at its best, and you take 1.5%, that's 450,000 tons of trash. Who or which country would want to bring in 450,000 tons of trash? If tomorrow on the 6 o'clock news we found out that we were importing from who knows where, 450,000 tons of trash, I guarantee you people wouldn't like it. So the fact that we're allowed that type of tolerance um, should be good enough, should be something that we can strive for. The next thought I have is, well, what do you do? If you can't ship it, uh, export it, something becomes problematic, where else do you go? So. This is a slide that I used for uh, a presentation last year uh, at the BEFA SA at the German Recycling Federation, which Thomas Brown is here. And thank you, Thomas, for, for being here. Um, I add India and Indonesia together um, in that year, and you're looking at about 1.2 million tons. That's for all import of all grades from around the world. India is a tenth the size of the import of China. And more so, or moreover, uh, countries such as in Indonesia and India, they don't want to be the dumping ground for the world. 
they don't want to have uh, people sorting, uh, children sorting uh, trash from, from landfills any more than we do. So um, I doubt that those are two saleable markets to which we can, quote, dump our material if we don't meet standards. So how can we compete? With changing regulatory environment, stricter standards or interpretation of those standards, as Simon mentioned, 100% inspection on mixed paper. How is our material going to stand up? And then you mentioned the, the Europe conference last week. The, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small to read, but um, this was the Europe conference, a photo I took while the Director General was presenting about the new circular economy package. And the first thing it says is that illegal waste shipments are a barrier to recycling and environmentally sound waste management. They're going to step up implementation and enforcement of the EU uh, waste shipment regulation 1013-2006, which is, you know, involves all the Annex 7 forms, which we love dearly, uh, and improve cooperation with member states. What does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is that since the fourth quarter of last year, we have had more shipments inspected at port in, uh, in the UK, uh, also in the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp, controlled, stopped, returned, and then uh, essentially nothing, nothing done with it. Checked off, it's okay. But then the cost of that, we're talking about not only hundreds of thousands of, of euros, we're talking about millions. We can better spend that money elsewhere. Now, I'm sorry, but when you said Mr. Pickles, I thought it was a joke. Uh, but, you know, he had, a, I don't know how much money he had, but I know in the world of recovered paper, uh, we can do a lot with a few million. We can do a lot to educate people um, and, and to, to work with our stakeholders to improve um, our story. So we're proud to be a part of Quality First. And I can even say that picture on the right is an inspection of a Midlands-based MRF handling commingled stream material two days ago and under break bail inspection was achieving less than 0.50% of outthrows. The only problem that they had was foil, plastic foil. That was it. No, no stop items, no nappies, but the key issue, and Simon raised it up earlier, is that they slowed it down. They slowed down the sortation. And I guarantee you that every one of my colleagues, inspectors, were there that day. I have a side question. Why do we need to inspect? If you look at Deming's principles of quality, process improvement, he very clearly states as one of the 16 rules that you should forever work on quality. Eliminate the need for inspection. It's inefficient. If you uh, employ process improvements, if you employ proper management, and you teach from beginning to end of the recycling process what it is to make quality, you will come out far, far better in the long run. <coughs> Key takeaways. We do need engagement between all stakeholders. It's crucial towards preserving the recycling economy that we've built in the last 25 years. Um, somebody said, well, Wade, you sound like a doomsayer. I'm not. It's just that after having committed my own 25 years of service to this industry, and those that have done the same or are doing the same, um, we have a great story to tell. We have a great legacy and one that I want to preserve. We need a product-driven approach, uh, and we need to involve the source as well as the processor and MRF operators, as well as the end user. Um, a lot of the tenders that go out um, allow for or require any and all materials that, that come from the recycling industry. Um, I don't see how it's economically feasible or viable to spend your way to death uh, with equipment and technology. I go back to 1995, 1996, when we had the great boom and bust year. Um, I was in Chicago, and we had, uh, I had responsibility for marketing uh, 17 uh, MRFs for waste management. And the city of C Chicago had just released a blue bag program. All of the tag stock and, and paper went in one blue bag, and then all of the rubbish went in a black bag. And it was a single pass collection. So, it increased the recovery rate tremendously, but then you needed lots of mechanical sorting at that plant to be able to get to the quality that you needed. And when the market went bust, uh, instead of paying for that raw material, we were, or 
receiving money, having a net gain on that material, we were paying ten, fifteen dollars a ton to get rid of our mixed. None of the domestic mills that we had negotiated contracts with, with the ink was barely even dry that third quarter. Uh, could we sell it to? They didn't want any of it. And that's when export began to arise. And that year, 1995, China imported less than one half of one million tons. So we've gone from one half of one million tons to last year, 28 and a half million tons. 19 million tons of that comes from the states. They have 70% market share right now. We peaked at about 40, 45% here in Europe and the UK. And we're slipping back. And believe you and me, my colleagues in the states are working very hard to get their systems optimized. That's the right word. Sorry, sometimes I think in Dutch and it doesn't come out right. But, um, to get their systems optimized um, so that they can produce a proper quality. So we're competing now truly across a global marketplace. All of the tons that are shipped from Europe, the UK, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, are all going direction China. And China is, is, is setting up the fence. Originally it was a green fence. Now we have a national sort. And then in the future, with the market factors changing, we may well end up with new policy. And our owner sits on the Consultative Congress in China. And uh, that's the, the, the Congress that determines uh, different policies. And, and the last one was uh, really dealing with environmental policy. And one of the things that we could see from last year is that there was a change of approach. And, and again, it goes back to what Simon was seeing and what our friends at, at Cycling, no doubt, also uh, see and, and Mark Lynn are the same. There is an absolute focus on protecting the environment and the health of the people in China. They are not going to import rubbish. Even at 1.5%, you're talking about over 250,000 to 500,000 tons of trash. And the one who can make the right product, deliver what the customer wants, wins the game. Very simple, quality first. Thank you. <laughs>